I, I just got to say before I start, because this is not going to be my standard podcasting interview. Um, I, I wish I had some drama man at home, at home because I, I would need to take it to stay on this roller coaster ride you're about to take us. But uh, all I would say to everyone is buckle up. This is going to be incredible. Chris, you're in the founding business. So if I ask you to do a one minute pitch of who you are, sure. I know you'll do it. So go for it. Sure. My name is Chris Joyce. I'm founder and CEO of a company called Gusher. Uh, Gusher is a platform to launch companies without the need for uh, capital, without the need for investors. Uh, people apply and join companies in exchange for performance-based equity. I'm also the founder prior to that of 24 other companies. My products have been sold in 11,000 stores, actually more than 11,000, in 23 countries across the globe. So I have a little bit of an understanding about business. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'm going to deviate for my, my usual routine sure. uh, to, to, for the large extent, but I want to start the same way. Uh, we're going to go into a time machine twice during the interview. The first one now and the next one, the second one at the end. So sure. the time machine, this one's going backwards. If we met when you were 15, 16, and I said to you, Chris, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would be the answer? Uh, exactly what I am now. Uh, literally, I set out from a very early age. My only goal at that time was to become an industrialist, uh, to own manufacturing companies. That's really where I saw the path as. Uh, and that's what I wanted to do from a very, very early age was to make things. That's literally was my calling. So what, but I think everything comes from the home, right? So were your, sure. parents, were your, were your parents entrepreneurs? Is that where you picked it up from? No, my, my, my mom was a low-level secretary at a government Air Force base in the middle of Ohio uh, who always wanted to do business, always had great, in hindsight, great business ideas. She never had a methodology to get them off the ground. So I saw that frustration. Now, later in life, in her 50s, she actually did finally make it. My father was actually my stepfather. And my stepfather was, well, I, I would say rough between the edges, but he was really actually just a mean SOB. Uh, and from an early age, you know, I would have certain ideas, and he was an electrical engineer by training, and he would literally crap all over them. And that didn't really, you know, uh, change my resolve. Actually, it kind of like doubled down my resolve to actually make things. I was like, well, F you, you're wrong uh, from an early age. And I guess that's really what's required as an entrepreneur in many ways. So and I'm going to be jumping all over the place because sure. you'll say something and then my brain will go on fire. So Definitely. Do, you, do you believe that entrepreneurs are born or they're made? I'd say yes. So let me explain what I mean, all right? So there's a certain type of entrepreneur that is born. So for example, and, and, you know, I don't necessarily think I'm that, but from the time that I was six years old, you know, I sold burpee seeds door to door. I was always looking to make a buck. It just interested me. I loved business from an early age. It just clicked. Then there are other entrepreneurs. Okay. These are the entrepreneurs that when they came up with an idea and somebody crapped on it, they were affected perhaps quite a bit, or perhaps they always have an idea but there was fear. So that fear almost in a way dictated many of their actions. And for different people, it's a different time curve to be able to find themselves. Miles Davis, a great jazz, uh, jazz player, has a statement that, and, and I'm probably hacking it to death. He said that sometimes it takes a long time to play like yourself. And so sometimes it takes different people a different amount of time to realize that what they've been born to do is to be an entrepreneur. What they've been born to do is to let that idea out. So everybody's path is different. I do believe that certain people are born right from the get go. And I fundamentally believe that most people are actually entrepreneurs at heart. It's just a matter of taking that risk and taking that jump and listening to that inner voice. So I'm going to ask you later a similar question. Once Shoot, we yeah. cover some of the other stuff, which would be, same idea. Are leaders born or can they be made? But we'll get to that because sure. that's because that's super crit that's very critical when it comes to entrepreneurship. But we'll get to that at the end. Interesting the Miles Davis analogy because my son was discovered in middle school by his by his music teacher as who played saxophone. Sure. He discovered him as a 
as a not quite prodigy, but he was very talented. And so he said, you got to get him a private teacher. He's incredibly talented. So we That's did. Cool. And he went through it and he, he had master classes, but some really, really phenomenal players and well-known names in New York City. But the, the point I'm trying to make is I remember, and I can't remember his name. He was a uh, a bass player that played with Miles Davis, but played with everybody. Okay. And he sat with the kids and it was a very small group with a master class. And he said, listen, let me give you a piece of advice. You guys are really, really good. This, this, there's entrepreneurial lessons here too, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna sure. watch your eyes. You guys are really, really good. You're talented. I wish I could play as good as you play at when I was your age. And I'm telling, this is a guy, I can't remember his name, but he. He's played, like great. He's everywhere, right? He played with every name in the jazz world, and he was older. And he said, "But let me tell you something. If you go home and you sit there, and you're gonna wait for the phone to ring because you're that good, you're gonna starve to death. So." If you want to make music, then go make music. And he said, look at me. I'm a black guy. I went, played in bar mitzvahs. I played in weddings. I played, I mean, I said African-American because he went to bar mitzvahs. I played in bar mitzvahs. I went on cruise ships. I played on the street. I played in the subway. Everywhere I had opportunity to play, I played. Absolutely. Because I wanted to play. What happened at the end was... Some people watch me play and discover that I am pretty good. So that's the path, right? So it was interesting you brought up Miles Davis. Um, all right, so I don't want to spend too much time because usually I do. But so you you go through high school. Tell me about your so your colleges. What did you go to college for? Or sure. Maybe- I, well, I was uh, in Ohio and I did anything I could to get out of Ohio. All right. So I graduated high school actually early. Uh, and I applied early, um, early admittance to NYU. So I studied business and finance at NYU, uh, right down in Greenwich Village. So I went straight from Ohio to NYU, and that was exactly what I wanted. Uh, within two days, I had a job on Wall Street, and then uh, there was the gloves off. Everything just went really, really rapidly from then. Wall Street as in... Uh on the floor or uh, I, I was in Oppenheimer. I worked at the time for the yeah. number one and two producers at Oppenheimer uh, on the number one producing boardroom floor in the country. Uh, and I learned a tremendous amount about sales. At the time, I became the youngest stockbroker ever. I think some kid whose dad owns a, a broker dealer became younger after me 10 or 20 years. But that was my claim to fame when I was like 17 or 18 years old. I became the youngest stockbroker ever. Did you, you did you have to did you used to have to make two three hundred call calls a day like everybody else I know in that? Well, world. here's how I got my license, and you may not believe what I actually did. Okay, so they had a standard method of cold calling, which is exactly what you described. They'd make a hundred, two hundred, three hundred calls a day. What I did is I basically created a new system called triple dialing, and this is going way back in my memory right now. So the long and short of it is, if you call different time zones uh, at very specific times, you get a much higher uh, calling rate, or you're able to get through and get much higher contacts. But at the same time, if you dial three numbers in, in sync simultaneously, you're able to keep contact flow at three times more than you would doing single dialing. So I was able to create a system that generated three times the amount of contacts If you're generating three times the amount of contacts, you're generating three times the amount of accounts. If you're generating three times the amount of accounts, you're generating three times the amount of assets under management, commissions, et cetera. So that's how I parlayed that into uh, being registered at such a young age. But so how did you do three three dials? So at the time, I can't remember what the phone system was. I think it was called Merlin's. So this is what you do. You literally, they had these three by five D&B cards. So it, what the key is, is to call a time zone an hour or two before the secretary gets in, uh, depending upon it. So what you and you deal with manufacturers of certain volumes and all these other subsets. So on these DMB cards, they have the number, they have the name. You literally have three stacks in front of you. You dial a number, put it on hold, hit the next number, dial it, put it on hold, hit the number, next, next number, dial and hold. And you're simply going, hello, 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 hello. First person that picks up, you take and go. And by the time, even if the second person hung up, you're on the third and you can handle it. 
Now they have automated systems that do almost in a way the same thing, but that was what, what we did and what I created long before. So that was amazing. Just, just for my audience, because I always like to, I don't assume that we all know when there's acronyms, but DMB, you mean Dan and Brad Street Car. Yes, exactly. I'm sorry. I, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Dan and Brad Street provided the data set on three by five physical cards. Yeah, which would probably today will be Zoom Info, maybe, yep. uh, or, or Hoover if they're Or saying. Norbert or, or Rocket Mail, Rocket Reach, everything else, yeah. Okay, so what at, at which point, so you go to work at this, this grinding, crazy universe of stocks and finance. Sure. When was the, the deciding moment when you say, I'm going to go off on my own? This is a thing I found out really quickly about myself. I hated, hated selling somebody else's stuff. I just absolutely hated it. So meaning that, you know, you have these companies, these broker dealers that do underwriting of specific companies and they'd like you to sell it or push that company, or you may be selling another company that somebody else did. I remember at the time selling Phillips Petroleum or something along those lines. And I sat there going and I said, this isn't creation. It's not me. I can create companies better than this. I literally remember thinking that I can create something better than this. And I was like, I'm out of here. I just, it, it's, it's just not for me. And I had to start my own companies. So how do you go from a paycheck to, I mean, obviously it's your universe today and we'll talk about Gasher later, but sure. yeah, how, yeah, do yeah. Go, how do you go from a paycheck to I'm going to stop my own company? What, what do you do? I mean, how old were you in this? In this so house? this is the thing. I was 19, 20 at that stage. All, All right. right. So, so 19, 20 is, is still a kid. Right. Though it sounds like you matured pretty early and you were pretty focused on what you want to do. But still, to go from paycheck to how do you even think about it? What company do you start? Okay. So this is this was my logic at the time, okay, is that I had almost no spend in terms of anything required. My overhead was nothing. So I'm living on 11th and 1st Avenue in basically a cockroach-ridden uh, building. I've never needed like great furniture or great clothes or anything else. I never needed really anything. I was like a minimalist, a Spartan. And so, again, the thing that did it for me, my drug, my, my crap, the thing that got me off was creation and, and trying different businesses. And we ended up going ahead and creating a business. If you remember back in New York in the late 80s, uh, there was something called paper call numbers. And so the first business we did was what's called a, a wrestling number. One of my friends had an idea for creating uh, a wrestling paper call line. Now, listen to this. At the time, it was called the WWF before it became the WWE. And he was convinced, and I just listened to him. I was along for the ride for the idea. He was convinced, actually, that there was a market for this information, that he had a network of truckers that traveled across the country that knew what was going on at these individual events. And basically, that putting that information up on the paper call line would generate interest. Like in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, Randy, uh, whatever the hell, won this type of match and doing this against blah, blah, blah. Well, what ended up happening is I footed the bill. We started the deal. And sure enough, we end up going ahead, just putting flyers, I swear to God, on cars, uh, going around the different boroughs, just putting them on cars. We had 50 grand the next month. But you didn't go to truck stops. No, no, no. He just had some people that were truckers and doing whatever that had that information that what would today be called content. So it's fascinating because uh, I remember those days. Yep. Um, and the people that listen to my podcast are uh, probably most of them don't. So it, but it's fascinating. So this is the paper call, which is uh, what there was a was there was a different number right toll free number it was a 900 they were they were 540 numbers in new york but okay. they also had 900 numbers uh yeah with the united yeah. states all over the place yeah. as so, so you would call and you actually be charged by the minute yes to listen to stuff which today is all free obviously but exactly at the time yeah. they had horoscopes they had dating lines they had yeah. all iterations of different products yeah so yeah it was i remember there was a lot of scams because people People are hiding that it was a paper call under a different number. You actually call. It's not like you had an option when when you called. Not I don't. I never used it, but I'm I'm guessing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. When you called the number, it didn't say like 
like a lot of stuff said today, hey, this call is recorded for quality approval for quality purposes. It didn't say, oh, by the way, starting now, we're about it's to five dollars a, a minute. Agree that right? Exactly. You just it, it, it was the wild bill. west. It, yeah. it was the wild and west. So you yeah, wanna, types of players. Yeah. yeah. You want to know how I came exposed to it? This is like in one of the companies that I worked. Somebody on my somebody on my team, my my boss. I hate the word boss. My employer. Yeah came to me with a phone bill and showed me the charges on 900 numbers that somebody has been calling from the office. Yeah. That's how this, that's how we came across it. Yeah. And, and, so it, and, and that became, I mean, that was really, it actually ballooned as an industry uh, for a period of probably almost 10 years. It grew pretty damn rapidly. Yeah. Pretty amazing. All right. So, so you go into the paper call universe and, what what event, what company, what adventure did you go into that sort of propelled you, like pushed you forward to where you can now you got it and you got into the into the rhythm? Sure. Well, it was it was basically one company after after another after that. So maybe it was one iteration of of that company with a different idea. But then you'd reach at least at that stage for me, it was ended up what I call golden handcuff deals. So even though they were making money, even though the individual businesses were good, you know, at that time, they didn't have the term scalable or being able to find something that's scalable and, and grow it a certain way. But that's really what I was searching for or trying to figure out and create is what's scalable. So at that time, I decided purposely to discontinue those deals. And I ended up going ahead and putting all my eggs into a basket as a business brokerage. So there was a guy named Tom West um, that ran a company called VR Business Brokers uh, that had 200, 300 units across the country that he retired. So here I am, 21, 22, 23 at the time, and I decided purposely to go into business brokerage for one reason, to learn as much as possible that I could about all these individual types of businesses, to see if there was something else there that I didn't think of or didn't see. So in a way, I was educating myself by doing a business brokerage deal, which is a very different world doing that in New York, uh, because you have everything from plastics manufacturers uh, to candy uh, companies to bars, restaurants, dry cleaners, stuff that you necessarily wouldn't have in the density that you have in other cities or other parts of the country. You can hit the ground running in New York, but it's extremely viciously competitive. So, so this was... So your exposure was to business brokerage, meaning somebody comes to you and said, I want to buy or want to sell a business and you kind of match make the two. Exactly. So it's kind of like real estate. You end up getting listings. Uh, then you have those listings and you try to sell those listings or fit it in with those listings. So by my estimates, we had a, a probably about 50 percent of the New York market uh, at any one time after the first year. We grew very, very rapidly. Uh, we came at it with a completely different model. Uh, the model in New York before was very much um, you know, two or three guys, let's say in a shop that they tended to know people for a very long period of time. It was very uh, mom and pop. And we took it, standardized it, processed it, expanded it, and made it so we had a lot of people going after it at the same time. So we, so, we basically processed it and standardized it to scale. I mean, for my, my networking days in Manhattan and, and being in, I don't want to mention the name because I really don't like them, but it's three initials uh, close to the alphabet. Uh, sure. there, there was a business broker in any one of, in any networking meeting always, yep. and the concept is, um, like you like you said, real estate, right? You match make them and you take a percentage of of the deal, right? Exactly. And what you learn real quickly is that, and well, if you're if you if you see really what what we saw or what I saw, is that I know this is going to sound crazy, but it almost laid the foundation for what I'm doing now because. What I concluded was, I don't care if it's a plastics manufacturer, I don't care if it's a chocolate retailer, I don't care if it's a dry cleaners, uh, literally almost every business is the same, except for they're just variants of three Ps, what I call three Ps. They're people, philosophy, and property. So, you know, what is the difference between Microsoft and Apple? Well, yeah, they have different different people. They have a different philosophy, most definitely. And their property, you know, what they're actually dealing with physically in terms of the assets and what they've created. But other than that, all right, 
it's the same damn structure. It's the same damn entities. And so when you conclude that, you can you can draw certain parallels between these industries, companies, everything else to, to make different conclusions that most people wouldn't. So in essence, you, you're a matchmaker and you have a database of guys that are looking for, for women. Sure. And you've got women coming and say they're looking for guys and you try to make the deal right the, the forever, absolutely i, I mean this, this is the the, the 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 story where love conquers all and your match re results in a in marriage absolutely and and with businesses it's it's a little bit you know it's complex because when you're dealing with real estate you're dealing with something that's standardized with businesses it's kind of like a, a person has to be told in a way their child is ugly. When they ha hear that, they don't really like it. They, so it's it's very much something that's part of them in a deeper way than maybe a house is. And so the sale of that is is it, I don't want to say extremely complex because not necessarily complex, but a lot of it is psychological. I mean, a tremendous amount of it is psychological involvement. And, and look, so I'm going to ask you the next question because yeah. clearly. You've got that bug in you since age six. Sure. And you've got the entrepreneurial drive. You don't want to work for people. You wind up in a matchmaking business stuff. And so the question I have is, and the reason I brought up the dating thing, yeah. do, do you fall in love with one of the women that is looking for someone? Meaning, how do you separate your, your feelings about the person sitting in front of you who is the owner entrepreneur right from is their business viable is it i mean is it a good idea was it, how do you separate that from your role as in my job is not to fall in love with my my dating candidate but to match make them well hear me out on this i think that if i made this a transactional relationship that i would not be good at what i do I think that that whole point of he who cares the least makes the most is total BS. So I also fundamentally believe that business is personal. So when somebody will say, don't take business personally or don't take this personally, it's just business. That is one of the things that pisses me off to no extent because business is personal. Personal. So in answer to your question, I do to an extent fall in love with almost everything that I get involved with, with the founders right alongside of them. So that's why if they need me to show up at CES, Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, to close the ex-chairman of Silicon Valley Bank on a deal, I'm on a plane doing that. If they need me in Wisconsin in the middle of winter to close a food manufacturing plant on part of their deal to get them involved, well, guess what? I'm sitting with them side by side in the snow, driving there and doing it or popping off the plane and driving and doing it and making it happen. So I get involved with the deals. And I think that you should. It, it, life is too damn short not to do something that you fundamentally care about or that makes your heart beat fast or to put it lightly, to, to fall in love with it. Yeah, I think that that's what you should be doing. Yeah, it, it's an interesting point because um, I'm... A business coach and when I sit down and, and meet clients who potentially want to work with me um, I'm very careful about not making a comment where I think your business or your idea has no future one because I don't know enough about it but so my 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 usual statement is I'm not a magician and I'm not going to promise you that you're going to hit it out of the park. I mean, these are yeah, 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 yeah. mostly mature. They're businesses that they're mature. They're not startups. And I said, I will, I will tell you that by the time we're done, your business will be completely different. You will be. It, now you, see, you touched, you touched on the keys, Zev, because I want to, I want to tell a quick story. All right. Go ahead. To explain it with my stepfather and all that stuff. When I was nine years old, I had an idea for a new type of break. OK, and he literally eviscerated it. I mean, worse than any VC has ever done, worse than any investor has ever done, everything else. And, you know, I, I, I was let, like literally destroyed. But at the same time, I was like, F you, uh, I'm just going to keep going, etc. So from that came a, a very important deal rule that I have. And you touched on it. Hear me out. You never kill a bad idea. 
And the reason you never kill a bad idea is because a bad idea is requisite. A bad idea is the stepping stone. A bad idea is the catalyst, the fuel for the good ideas. You never just have good ideas. But if anything, bad ideas evolve into good ideas. Yes, occasionally somebody has that bolt of lightning and that lightning bulb go off and suddenly it's a great idea. But great business as businesses aren't necessarily created that way. They're created with this bad idea. You put people together, it suddenly becomes a better idea. They're then creating iterations of it. Then suddenly somebody else brings something from out of left field, which takes it in a little bit of a different direction. And oh my God, now you've got something that's market viable. Now you have something that actually can penetrate the market and actually succeed. But the path is not just, hey, I have a great idea. And the path shouldn't be just, hey, I have an idea, now kill it. Because that that kills so much human potential, it, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, and for anybody we know, including ourselves, when you have an idea, 95%, 98% of the people you're going to present it to are going to say, that sounds interesting, but... And the but will be a long list of why it's never going to work, et cetera, et cetera. So interestingly, because even though I'm, I'm a business coach, but my focus initially is on marketing because the growth of the business is critical. I hear it all the time. You know, marketing doesn't work. I tried this. I tried this. I tried this. It didn't work. I spent a fortune. And I looked at them and I smiled and said, why are you smiling? And I said, because it does work. What I've seen in my little universal, in the trenches of small business is Almost always, it didn't work because the execution failed. Marketing works. It's not that complicated. Or they were on the wrong, wrong foundation, or they had the wrong voice, or they were going after the wrong market, or they were going after the right market, but not recognizing the cycle takes longer than what they expected. All those different right. iterations. Or, or, they, or they came up with something that's no, not differentiated of anything else, so they're a commodity, and so they don't really matter, right? Exactly. Course, right? Exactly. So, Okay, so well, but hold up, Zeb. I want to touch on one point there regarding marketing and startups and everything else. Th there's one thing that I say to almost every founder, regardless of the industry. So it can be consumer goods, manufacturing, SaaS, fintech, AR, VR, AI, gaming, medical devices, prop tech. So we go into it, we're talking and we're talking about what their business is, et cetera. And I'll say, for example, I go, you know, you do realize your company is not a medical device company. And it's just silent. Or I'll say, you do realize your company is not a fintech company or not a, a dog food company or whatever it may be. And they're like, what are you talking about? I go, listen, I go fundamentally at your core, at least starting up, it's really, it has to be part of your DNA. I go, you are a marketing company first and foremost. Marketing cannot be an afterthought. Marketing has to be put in place from the very beginning stages, almost from ideation as part of your DNA. That's the way you succeed as a company. Yeah. And, and so, again, I, I'm, I'm going intuitively because of things you said. There's so many things you said that just resonate with me because they remind me of things that I believe in. Um, so let's, let's go to, to the point you just made, sure. which is the question that I ask every entrepreneur that either I work with or I'm part of a platform called Growth Mentor, yep. uh, where I'm mentoring people literally from all around the world. It's one of the most phenomenal things I've ever gotten involved with. For free. Yeah. I, I woke up this morning at 8 a.m. I was mentoring a brilliant lady in Vietnam who was talking about rebranding their company. And at the end, what we decided is what you don't need is a rebrand or you need a freshen up stuff, right? You, there you, you go. Modern. But so the first question I ask everyone, and more often than not, you'll get the deer in the headlights there to the point you just made. Yep. What problem are you solving? Okay. So I want to jump this. I have a whole list of questions and I want to get through them. Sure. I want to jump. Let me dive right into. Gusher. Fire them off. Let's go. Let's go right to Gusher. Sure. And tell me what problem you're solving. Talent is spread evenly opportunity is not, we are fixing that. So let me explain. So the vast majority of people out there think that money is a barrier and required to go ahead and start a company. If you ask 99.999% of people, if they had an idea or do they have an idea, would they go ahead and start it? Yes, but, but they don't start it because they think the barrier is money. 
All right. So our only point is to untap as much human potential as possible. It doesn't matter whether they're in Portugal or Korea or Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, the fact of the matter is 95 percent of all venture capital dollars are from Silicon Valley, New York and Israel. So unless you're located there and unless you fit a pattern uh, that they look for, venture capitalists, your chances of getting funding is non-existent with us. Gusher solves that. It allows you anywhere, any type of person, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of income level, education, location, to be able to get your company off the ground for nothing, literally nothing, <clears throat> in the expertise of others. Right. So people that are listening are going to say, wow, he's so full of it because there's nothing for nothing. Yep. But I, I looked at your model and I happen to think that it's brilliant because the model which which is by the way the same principle that drives companies forward from an incentive standpoint yep employees is and that's what i've done with every client i've had in the past 10 of years stop the annual bonus bullshit enough of this it does not work yep if you are if you want your employees to take ownership of their job and get excited of coming to work every day and feel that they make a difference then you got to share the wealth and if Absolutely. you share the wealth, then do this on a quarterly incentive basis. The company does well, you do well. And you 100%. know what? It's a no-brainer. The, the biggest barrier to getting there is that the majority of entrepreneurs and, and family-owned business, which is kind of my specialty, uh, and maybe it's changing a little bit, but not fast enough, are greedy. They just don't care. They look at an employee is something I need. I got to pay them. So that's why I'm going to squeeze the living daylight out of them. And I got to get every cent out of them. And I'm going to give them a bonus maybe at the end of the year. But but think of this. I, I think COVID made a lot of, of things bubble up. And I think that the next, the next progress, or I should say, the way that things progress down the entrepreneurial path is going to come in a different way. Let me explain. I think, first of all, we're just on the cutting edge of seeing an explosion in entrepreneurship. Okay, that's number one. Number two, people want to own. They want to own something. They want to own parts of it. They want to own the entire thing. They want to own something of it. So they want to put effort in, not get a paycheck, and then five years later, they get laid off, or not when they get older and their health care gets too expensive, they get <clears> laid off. They want to own it and to be able to go ahead and create it and be involved in it. The, the last thing is they want to have something that has impact. And so these companies that that are created with what I call the linear mindset of what you described, where they want to have everything, they want to just pay people a little bit of bucks and do whatever. That's great. But they're going to be slaughtered, slaughtered by what I call the teams that have a vested interest in the success of the company. OK, so, for example, the companies that come together and, and we're not I'm not promoting it here, but on Gusher, they aren't transactional. So if a dog food company is created, uh, these are people that all own dogs. They don't have children. They own dogs. They get dogs. They understand the market. So they're able to put together a company that's way better than another company where it's not just that DNA that they don't have. So it comes down to the people having the DNA, that vested interest in pushing that sled up that mountain or pulling it up the mountain that makes a better company from the very beginning. So your model and, and I'll. I'll tell you what I think it is, because that's the only way I can figure out if I got sure. it correctly. I have an idea. I come to Gusher. Instead of chasing the the road frequently traveled of chasing money, yep. giving, up, giving up equity, you know, the shark tank deals, whatever. You say, listen, you can start. We have the, the way you, you the way you get successful is by assembling a team of specialists. I, I always refer to it as like the Navy SEALs model, right? It's yep. a team, everybody, they all work together, but everybody specializes in one thing. Then you go forward and you complete the mission, right? Exactly. So you need talented people. We have access to them. You don't necessarily have to pay them. You'll bring them in. But what you have to do is say, okay, I'm willing to give up X on, but the key for you is performance, right? Right. So think of it this way. The, uh, many companies have been formed, let's say, trying to use equity as the incentive from the very beginning, and uh, including myself for, for years. It's fundamentally flawed. So what ends up happening is people will go ahead and always have that smiling face or they have good intent from the very beginning. 
And so in a way, when you use time as a vesting a yardstick, like it'll vest every six months or a year, whatever it may be, people will hang on. They'll hang on for time, so on and so forth. But when you put performance behind it, that nobody gets anything, unless they're able to achieve their goals, unless the company is able to reach the launch stage and get into the marketplace, well, then it's a different scenario. Then people are rowing in the same direction. They're rowing under a time frame to get it done, all right, to, to really reach this launch stage. And more importantly, they're not really creating a minimum viable product because they actually have equity in this. They want something that sells. So what they're creating is a market viable product. It's a fundamental difference in company creation. You don't create an MVP in the common sense of the a word. What you're doing is using talent. You're using people who are great at what they do to leapfrog generational development and create a market viable product from the get-go. There's no magical product market fit issues or anything else. You have that from the beginning because you put the team together the right way and created the product the right way. Uh, this is this is brilliant. Look, I'm, I, I love disruptors. I've, I've considered myself a disruptor in my little universe. Sure. Um, but disruption is, is the way to go. And, and, when you look at something that's been done the same way over and over again, and yes, it's it comes down to what I, I'm I'm sure you believe in and what how I was raised: work smart, don't work hard, right? Absolutely. Uh, and so you can beat yourself against the wall chasing the traditional methods of funding companies, and your chances of success are minimal because there are thousands of people doing exactly what you do. So. Yeah. Um, Again, because that thought came into my my brain, we're talking about incentive. I'm just just curious to take your take on. There's still some industries, insurance, home improvements, that employ people, sales reps on commission only models. Sure. Which, to this day, when I hear that word, I shudder. I hate it. I just scream and yell. You have no right to ask somebody to run around on your behalf and pay them nothing with this stupid carrot dangling thing in front of them. But yep. those industries, that's the, the way they function. What do you think about that? I mean, it's still around. The, the, the model itself, and hear me out, I've been guilty of that model. Okay. So with the business brokerage in my early twenties, that was the model. And the reason was the following. I want to take it from, from one side and then the other. Okay. The reason was the following. The vast majority of people weren't qualified to be in the industry, yet you didn't know that until effort was made. So you would have to go ahead and rotate 10 people in to get one to stick. Now, usually it was very easy for us to determine that. It only took about two or three hours. We'd send them down Fifth Avenue and say, hey, go, go ask each business for their business card. And those that showed back up two, three hours later, we would train. Those that didn't, well, we knew they weren't cut out for it, okay? But with certain industries, uh, like even insurance right now, uh, that were very commission-based, they're paying a base salary. So I think that's something where that's evolving. I think it's something that almost in a way has to evolve because there's so much competitive for labor right now that I think commission-only businesses tend to die in terms of what they're doing. I think it's a hard, hard path. But also remember that the people that are typically doing that, and I don't want to paint it in, in a bad light, are many times geared for that. So they're more of a hunter mentality. They're not there for a nine to five sitting behind a desk or necessarily even being told what to do. They almost in a way are founders themselves, but they don't have a product. And so that sometimes fills a need. And if the market is there to support it, I fundamentally believe in market economics, but the humanity side of me says, hey, there should be something there where the company's taking some of that risk too right from the beginning. Yeah, and, and you, you're absolutely right. I have a friend that has a home improvement company, which is why I know that. Yep. Um, fourth generation, 103 years in business. Not You don't run into them too often. Uh, commission, only, commission only sales where you got to go to the homeowner's kitchen and talk about the roof, the windows, the sidings, and you got to close right there. Otherwise, there's three other companies calling on the same person. Yep. They... And he asked me to help him, but we cannot find anyone. I mean, it's, it's rough. It's anyone tough. Anyone in the past two years, forget COVID, that wants to go into this business. And and I think, yes, I, I like how you present it. I never heard it done that way. You know, it's like you know, send to 10 people out to get collect business cards. The one that comes back with the cards is the one that's the hunter. Got it. 
but I think something changed also. We have got the millennials who is going into these universe. They don't want to work so hard because if, if you want to call on a, on a homeowner to sell them a new roof, they want to meet you at 730 in the evening. But hear me out on this. Like if I was dealing with that, that, that model, the, the contractor model, fixing the roofs, whatever it may be, I would fundamentally possibly view it differently. So I, I would create the position. I don't know if this would work or not. And I know I'm just, we're just kind of spitballing here, but I would go ahead and create something like a protected franchise area. I would have it where, okay, they're a lead generator for the sales. Uh, and so they're providing the leads. Somebody has a buy-in 10,000, 20,000 to be able to have this protected area. So now there's a level of person uh, that you're attracting right off the bat that's made a commitment. And it's again, has to deal with ownership. You've gone ahead and given them set up for ownership. You set them up for success. If they they follow through, they're not going to have success. So they don't have to sit there and almost in a way beat the people to go ahead and do it or just take the hunter model. I would really turn it into more of a self-sustaining business model. I, I, and I would have them evolve and do a test to see if something like that would work. But that's right. just me. so. So I want to get to to some of my questions. Forget the home improvement universe. Sure. Uh, we're definitely going to go past the hour. Do you have a few minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have some. Okay, Absolutely. perfect. All right. So quoting you is the best way I can lead into this. Oh, my um, God. I believe great ideas can come from anyone, anywhere. Yes. And I believe the market and not venture capitalists should be the judge of whether or not these ideas see the light of day. And I think you articulated that concept really well. So you're disrupting something that, that people are taught and follow all the time. How do you select which company to, which company to partner with people that come pitch you? And yeah. He hear me out. Okay. So we believe in that the only vetting mechanism that matters is not me, not a VC, not some committee, not some group of people. We believe that the market is the best vetting mechanism there is. So do we sit here passing judgment on an idea? No. Okay. But does Gusher, the platform itself, pass judgment on the idea? Yeah. But let me explain how it does it and how we get involved. Okay. So somebody comes into Gusher. They, they put their idea, problem, solution, market. They start figuring out a team. They may talk with me or somebody else. We put it out there. There's something that really determines whether or not that company is going to be one of the 80% that becomes self-sustaining or attract larger scale capital, or they're going to be one of the 20% that fail. It's a very simple thing. You're not necessarily going to believe it on it when I tell you what it is, but we find out pretty damn quickly. So we have a saying on Gusher, all right? One plus one does not equal two. One plus one does not equal two. One plus one equals done. What do we mean by that? The companies that are able to attract, the founders that are able to attract one person, one for performance-based equity into their startup, into their deal, are the ones that go on to be able to create the product, create the company, create their platform, and launch into the marketplace. If you can't attract one person into your company, that idea dies on the, bank, on the vine. It dies pretty damn quickly. And so our thesis is really the companies, the founders that can recruit. And th that's the hardest part of it. It literally is the hardest part to bring that first person on because it involves talking a certain way. It involves a certain level of authenticity. It involves being able to communicate your problem very effectively, and it involves being able to find people, the vested interest market, that share that same problem or understand it into your deal. Those things come together. Those are the companies that take off. And it doesn't take long to figure out who those are. So how does that process actually work? So I have an idea. I come sure. to you. Do you now send it around to everybody and say he's around and then I have to do my own pitch, my own connections? It's a little bit of both. So let me explain. Uh, and let me give you a, a hard and fast example. So we've got a deal on our platform called Happy Howl. The, the company's name is Altai, but its brand name is Happy Howl. So Colin came into Gusher a while back and he had a sick dog. Uh, the vets kept telling him to go ahead and feed this uh, dog, this dog food, another dog food. And the puppy kept dying. I mean, it literally kept dying. So he hacked a dog food over three, four, five, six months together and slowly brought this dog back to life. 
So his brilliant idea was, well, if I'm the person in this situation, I'm not the only one, let's create a dog food company. Now, a dog food company is one of the most capital intensive industries there is. It's one of the most red ocean industries there is. <clears throat> Colin puts it up on gut. Uh, uh, he goes ahead and starts recruiting. Gusher, you have natural flow of people applying to your deal, everything else. He brings on these people uh, that were top level. I can't manage, uh, can't name the companies they're in, but they're companies that that you have product in your cupboard at home, okay? That, that type of, of person, very big players have managed 50 million, 100, 200 million dollar budgets. The company imploded six weeks later, okay? The second company that he went, or uh, the second uh, team that he started recruiting, he listened to me because founders don't listen to me the first time around, all right? He listened to me. And I've already told you the answer, but these uh, people that made up his team all had something in common. It's a dog food company. What do you think they had in common, Zev? They all owned? They own dogs. and the dogs They own dogs. But they didn't have kids. They were dog parents. They ate dog. They breathed dog. They lived dog. They pooped dog. They are dog zealots. They got the market. So flash forward a year and a half later, that company's worth more than $10 million. It's growing 30% month over month, and it's kicking ass. So, you know, the, the teams that come together on Gusher – have a vested interest. And so it's a little bit of both. We show the founders what to do. They have to do the recruiting. It's kind of like sales validation. A founder has to do that recruiting. Do we help them out? Yes. Do we hold their hand? Yes. Do we try to as much as possible to get them through getting that first person? Yes. Once they get that first person, the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh my God, you really don't need money to do this. You need to go ahead and have the process. And so we have the process for them. We have the, the, the platform for them. We, we have the, all the legal and everything else for them and we hold their hand every step of the way. So just to be clear, the people on your network, the specialists, the talent sure. who take the leap of faith, well, it's more than faith because they have to have a gut instinct that this is going to work. They're going to work for free based on on performance it's not free and let me explain see that's where there's a hang-up sometimes with founders okay. yeah so equity is some of the most expensive capital you can do so let me explain with a typical startup the way they're founded or or provided standard investment dollars a typical valuation would be between, be between five and ten million with the average, let's say, software company coming in at seven, the average consumer goods company coming in at four to five. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because when you're dealing with performance based equity, what you're doing is allotting a certain percentage of that equity to go ahead and get X amount of work done whatever that may be. So, so with a CMO, all right, a chief marketing officer, it may be a 2% position in equity to be able to come up with a marketing plan, to be able to help recruit a creative director and a social media director, to create a, a the personas and whatever, and do some basic market research, to be able to figure out a launch plan that enables you to go ahead and get, let's say that 2% equity, all right? But you work working for specifically uh, being able to get that equity. It is founder's stock. So it's not an hourly. They don't tell you when to work or anything else, but it's using your excess capacity, time that you have excess capacity to build up a potential asset by investing in this company. By, by not investing, but by really giving your time, by going ahead and performing and creating and knocking off those goals one by one. Perfect. Um a few more things. I got a whole list. I'm not gonna, never going to get through this stuff. You can do uh, it rapidly. I can answer rapidly. Oh, I, I've got the rapid for you. Trust me, because I knew you're going to handle it. You're going to love it. But that's coming at the end. Okay. Um, I, I think you sort of hinted to it, but uh, greatest motivational quote I heard in a while. What you look for, you'll find. Make your own luck. Odds are meaningless. See, Completely you're meaningless. the kind of guy that like disruptive thinking and saying it's not so there are people that do motivational quotes because it sounds cute and people get excited like one of my clients went to a tony robbins you know seminar you know one of these workshops sure. three days walk on fire at the end spend ten thousand dollars yep we work together and then and after a couple of weeks because i knew it was going to happen i said you didn't learn anything did you it was exciting to be there you came home and told everybody you went to tony robbins entertainment 
right? And then yeah. it died, right? Which is a problem with diets and motivational stuff. Uh, and then he went again, and then he signed up for one of his VIP things. And I said, so sure. why keep doing this? Um, back to you, odds are meaningless. Make your own luck. As as a as one of the best quotes you mentioned, you ever heard, what's the message here for entrepreneurs, for even business owners, not just sure. from this is what they have to understand, that the odds may be stacked against them, but how are the odds derived? OK, the odds are derived from all the people that don't go after it. The odds are derived from the people that give up early. The odds are, are derived from literally statistics that have no meaning whatsoever to them. I have found literally whatever I go after, whatever I go after, I get. It doesn't matter. It may take longer. Uh, it may be more painful than I thought. It may take more time. It may be have more bumps in the road. But the fact of the matter, if you focus on something, laser focus, you're not listening to the outside news. You're not going and having outside distractions. You're not doing whatever. You will get there. You will get exactly what you look for every time. But Chris, it's so hard to not pay attention, to not listen, because it's coming at you nonstop, right? How yep. do you... How do you get to that, that your own cocoon where you're shielding yourself from the crap that's surrounding us and you keep plowing ahead? This is what you have to understand. It's a muscle. Okay. So it's a muscle. You have to work that muscle. You get better at it. Uh, the one thing that I do, and I, I don't believe in this necessarily with business, but I believe in, in saying no to almost everything. Uh, I say no to uh, going places. I say no to flip it on Google News uh, and reading uh, news stories when I have some downtime. I say no uh, to negative people. I say no to competition and hearing what's going on or anything else. When, when I start a task, I focus. And I focus until I get to that end game. That doesn't mean that I don't spend time with my kids. Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't go to their events. That doesn't mean that I don't laugh with my wife and have fun. But what it means is all this outside stuff is nothing but kind of like a dog uh, as you're walking down the road that sees a squirrel. And every five seconds or every one second or every half a second, there's another squirrel. And guess what the dog does? The dog goes after the damn squirrel. So are you a squirrel or are you a smart person that can turn this shit off? Because that's all it comes down to. Focus, 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 get what you want. And one thing, I mean, it, it's not always necessarily worth the price. It's not always easy, but it's either way, you're going to be paying a price one way or the other, whether you get it or whether you don't, whether you choose to go after it or you don't. I choose not to be a person uh, that swallows down my dreams and hates myself and goes after a mediocre life. I don't want anything to do with it, period. I just don't want it. And And the good news is that I believe the I don't know if there was a study, but the, the general accepted norm is that most entrepreneurs quit unbeknownst to them just before the point of making it. They just Absolutely. walked away, right? And so to back to your point is you, you keep plowing ahead, you say no, and you see dry because that's what you want. I'm going to go get it. But, but here's the thing, Zev. I mean, it's like that in every aspect of life. Okay. So for example, um, I, am, I have a frozen shoulder. Okay. And I have a frozen shoulder. And so I'm going to, to rehab or therapy, whatever the hell it is for it. And so the first week we made, you know, all this type of movement and, and making progress the second week, no matter what I did, no matter what I did, it just wouldn't budge. It just wouldn't budge. And so the following week, we're now in week three of it, it suddenly just goes and goes, you know, the whole way and mostly unfreezes or does thaws. And I know this is a simplistic visual of what it is, but everything is like that. All right. Whether you're learning something new, whether you're trying a business, whether you move to a new city, you're going to have these periods where suddenly everything just breaks through. And most of the time you're just pounding, 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 pounding. That's the way growth happens. It's going through pain. It's going through the furnace. Just accept it. It's part of the process. It's not unique. It has to be part of the process. So the, I'm going to go to two quick things. I'm watching the clock, but it's fine. Yeah, you, sure. In one of the videos, one of your clients touched on something that I always bring up with anybody that I work with. Greg, I, I guess, Bees. Beezer. Beezer, right? Yeah, sure. He said, um, if I drop dead on the trail, 
my company will keep going. Yep. That's the measure of how Gusher has brought, what Gusher brought to the table, right? Yep. That's my first. So I've, I ask business clients of mine, but anybody I work with, I ask them two questions. One, what does this business mean to you? Because the answer tells me if I'm going to work with them or not. If they care about money, I'm done. But the second question is, what's your disaster recovery plan? And they look at me and said, I don't even know what you're talking about. So this is the piece that what Greg is mentioning, I think is so critical. So so many owners don't think about it. It is literally life-changing when you ask them the question. Sure. And they realize even if obviously disaster recovery is if the founder drops dead and he's the visionary, maybe everything stops. But it applies to other key positions in the company or your key customer or your number one sales guy if they leave. So talk about that for a little bit. So yeah, from, sure. from Greg's perspective, yeah. Well, I, and from Greg's perspective, I think he's he's primarily talking about, I think it really is addressing the, the main issue here is that he meant the depth of his team was there to basically be able to carry on the torch and keep the company running and to grow it. And the measure of, of a true company is that whether or not it's a job versus a business is that exact question. What happens if you die? Well, if you die and that business dies, well, that was a nice job. It wasn't a business in the real sense of a word. Uh, a business is something that you can walk away from. You can go on vacation, uh, that your people can run the show and actually even grow it better uh, many times when you're not involved with it. So, you know, when it comes down to having a backup plan or secondary plans or anything else, you know, one of the things that we always uh, teach our team members is to make themselves almost in a way irrelevant. Their job is to make themselves irrelevant by be creating the structures and the processes so that they can build it. It's meaning that you want to build on the right foundation. It's great having a bunch of people there and it's great having uh, uh, everything hunky dory one minute, but stuff happens. Life happens. Shit happens. Uh, we've seen it where uh, founders, uh, their, their spouse has been uh, in a motorcycle accident and suddenly they have to go ahead and nurse them for the next nine months, 12 months. And yet, how the hell do you keep a company going during that? Well, if you built the company the right way with the right team, it can. I've got a founder right now I'm thinking of uh, that's in South Africa, that's 7580, and um, she's not really up to fully running that company right now. She just went through COVID. Uh, she almost died. Uh, they thought she was going to die. She actually lived. And so, you know, how does she go ahead and progress? Well, you know, her number one person has effectively taken over the chief executive responsibilities and has grown it and is now taking it even further. And she's a she's a marketing person uh, by trade. So literally, it's it's putting those foundational pillars in place, which are people, but also processes to go ahead and make sure that it can go ahead and back up if something happens. I mean, that's yeah, a little bit. And I have to say, one of the guys that I absolutely admire and I love his process uh, is the profit guy, you know, uh, Lamont. Yes. I mean, and, you know, when I used to be networking, people used to say, what do you do? And I said, do you ever see the profit? He said, yeah. I said, that's me, except I'm not going to write a check. But that's right. my that's my mindset when I go into a business. So there there are two more quotes, then rapid fire, um, because you say so many things that that you said. Oh my God, I'm so, so happy somebody feels the way I do. Fighting within a company done the right way. That lie. That's where there were light ingredients for greatness: intense passion and arguments. I always used to get into fights in company meetings. And you know what happens in the stupid ass politically correct artificial yep. nonsense? You get called into the, you know, the, the CEO, the president office, or the owner, and say, you know, and I said, you know what? Do you want people to just be robots? Or do you want right. people to openly discuss and passionately talk about what they believe in? This can be, and and I've never been abusive. I've just right. I get excited. Sure. But not calling names, and they don't like it. It's a stat, you know. Let's go to the agenda. Let's look at the boring PowerPoint with 17 bullets. 
But but that 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 has to do with a company's DNA. I, I fundamentally believe that again, a, a company that's like that is susceptible to competition, and it's susceptible to competition from a company that is you know you say passionate. I say it has a very big vested interest uh, in terms of their people in making it happen. So yeah, we've got Perina dog food, but do they eat, breathe, live, and poop literally dogs to the to the extent that Happy Howl does? I'd say no. I mean, these people live it 24-7. When it comes to arguments and, and fighting for your beliefs, one of the things we tell people before they join Gusher, I'm talking my core team, is that we literally fight. And so the point is, if you don't fight, it doesn't necessarily mean that, or I should say, it means that, at least in my, my perspective, you don't necessarily care that the stronger that you fight for something, for your viewpoint, you go ahead and care. And it's important. It doesn't mean that we call people names and do whatever, but we fight. I mean, fight, fight, fight. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's 100% a good thing, so long as it doesn't degrade into the other crap that comes with it. Fighting for an idea and fighting for uh, fighting to insult a person are two fundamentally different things. And and not to bring politics to the discussion because today is election day, but yeah. uh, one of the things that infuriates the crap out of me because I'm a Democrat, I've always been. Sure. Is is that the idiot Democrats have not learned nothing, nothing from the past, the the Trump years. And I and I, if somebody likes him, it's fine. I respect everybody's opinion, but they've they learned nothing, which is you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Okay, so if you're passionate, they they've been they've been sleeping at the wheel, and I hope it doesn't <clears throat> doesn't turn out to be today. Um, right. The results will be different, but I fully expect a complete trashing because they think that being a nice guy. Back to the corporate world. Oh, sure. you gotta be nice. No, you you you, you should be nice. But when the, when the platform is open for you to really share how you feel, then let it out because we can learn from, right? So Absolutely. let me jump to the let me jump to the next one. Sure. This is this is one of the best ones because I heard a quote and I forgot who it was recently that I said, "Wow, brilliant!" Don't take advice from anyone whose risk is less than yours if you follow their advice, right? Your version of it. When in doubt, listen to yourself, the good part of yourself, the part that challenges you, and ignore the rest of the bad advice, which one of your videos, because ultimately you're the one living it, right? A absolutely. But I, I think it comes down to the possibility of regret. And I think it's even more simple than what I said there. I can live with myself with a decision that resulted in a bad outcome because I made that decision based upon what I believe to be correct, okay? I cannot live with myself with a decision that resulted in a bad income when I took the advice of someone else. Mm -hmm. So if my gut is screaming at me, and even if someone else is disagreeing or whatever else it may be, like vehemently, I, I will go with my gut and what I think is, think is, is correct. Even if that is a minority, which most times it is, even if it's a contrarian voice, which most times it is. Amazing. All right. Rapid fire. Sure. Here we go. One person that influenced your life, not business. Not business. Uh, my mom. All right. One person influenced you in business. Ayn Rand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Author. One book that impacted you the most. Well, there you go. Uh, Fountainhead. Um, by the way, some of these I steal for morning grew because it's one to me. Morning Brew is, without a doubt, the most entertaining, brilliantly written daily newsletter that I've ever come across, ever. And these guys are just geniuses. So some of them, they have some of these rapid things. Sure. Um, what always makes you laugh? What? Oh, my wife. <laughs> my wife. A psychologist that makes you laugh. She's got to be special, man. She is. Um, if you were given a billboard in Times Square, what would you put on it? What would I never give up? 100% never give up. Uh, what's the best advice you ever received? What's the best advice I've ever received? Here's the thing, okay? I haven't been given really advice. So I would have to say never give up. And people don't give me advice. Okay. Um, 
What's the most embarrassing song you song you'll admit to liking publicly? What's the most embarrassing song? Oh my God. Let's see. Uh, maybe take on me by aha from like 30 years ago. <laughs> um, what I right, last two, what fictional person do you wish you, do you wish were real? What fictional person do I wish was real? Okay. This, he may actually be real because I think it was, but I'm not sure because it was also little house on the prairie. Um, the Ingalls guy, whatever it is, what would, uh, who's the Ingalls father? Because oh, Charles, I, yeah. I know it sounds crazy, but my wife and I watch that all the damn time. And it's the most corniest thing, but I love that show. All right. What real person do you wish were fictional? That's a loaded question. Uh, what real person, Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's like, it's, I've been going nuts because I said when he bought Twitter, I said, God help us. Another billionaire who's getting, getting the megaphone and yep. that's how to lead our lives. Exactly. The, the public enemy number one for me is Zuckerberg. What Facebook has destroyed the universe. The way oh, I wish I would have said that. I wish I would have said that. That's you know, a better answer. And, and I think Elon Musk is close second because you know what? These, I mean, I have respect for what he's done from a business standpoint. Uh, is a guy that had crazy ideas, you know, but sure. uh, uh, anyway, don't want to go there. It's fine. Okay. Uh, I, I, I want to take that back and say Zuckerberg, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> That's fine. such a good answer. Uh, yeah. So Chris, this has been amazing. Uh, thank you so much for saying yes to me. Sure. Uh, cause you, cause you said one of the things you do all the time is say no, but you did say yes. And I'm really happy you did. Uh, I will, in my show notes, if somebody wants to find you, go to gusher.co. Gusher is G-U-S-H-E-R.co. Right. You'll find Chris there. If you want to connect him, find him on LinkedIn. Uh, this has been amazing. Probably the longest running podcast. I'll probably trim some parts of it. Probably my AOL story. I don't know how that's going to be. I received. like that story. That right. was for you, but I'll probably cut it out. Um, and that's it. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Zev. It's been a real pleasure on my side. Same here.